Okay, chat, so we... We are basically going to go straight into the final thoughts. I, I will leave partial spoilers in the chat. I don't feel like clearing it. Listen, the short summary, because I would like to go on a very long rant after playing this game, is this was one of the worst games I have ever played. It is unpolished. It feels unfinished. It is a what feels like a passion project, but either they ran out of time or they were clueless with the mechanics. Pick one, or both, it doesn't matter, but something happened and the game went wrong. <laughs> so let me be very clear. We'll briefly state all the positives before we go into the spoiler section. Uh, sprites were nice, music was nice. And so that's the end of the list. I hope you enjoyed that list. We're going to now go into spoilers because I have so much to complain about in terms of literally everything. Just literally everything was bad, and I'll tell you why. And we'll explain with like a little bit of a walkthrough with my first impression of the early game. And we are going to go into the absolute madness that was chapter three into chapter four. So like early on, I feel like the game was somewhat promising, right? Like I went in not knowing what to expect. I've heard nothing but praise while from other people that this is one of their favorite SNES games, if not the best SNES game of all time. So the bar is set already really high because I like Quintet. We've played all the other Quintet games for the most part related to this game. And we will continue to play other Quintet games after this game. But wow, um, I, I guess in terms of positive things, I like that when you picked up pots and threw them at people, they had unique lines of dialogue. I think they experimented a little bit with uh, dramatic cutscenes where we had some unusual camera angles. Like for example, we were talking to Elle through a wall. And so like when we tried entering the locked door, the camera panned over to her and she had dialogue. I think the very, very literal first hour of the game was done mostly fine. It's a little cliche with the setup into the open door, into opening Pan Pandora's box and whatever. And it, it tries to set up for a somewhat interesting premise. The Elder is being kind of cagey. He's not really explaining why you need to do these things or why he has what is very literally Pandora's box in the basement of the house. So already, you know, maybe there's little, little curiosities there. And you're like, oh, maybe the game will explain it at some point. And then I think the moment you step outside of Krista is where the game starts to show some cracks. Um... They have this kind of overworld in the sense where it's not flat. Normally, when you think of, you know, moving around on maps, you think of just top down, your character's a sprite, they move wrong on a flat grain. This one has kind of a 3D effect to it. So as you like move towards the top of the screen, more things pop into view as it like kind of gets over the curvature of the what you find out to be the underworld. And it has one of the most nauseating visual effects I've seen in a while. So to to demonstrate that it's the underworld they do kind of like a mirrored reflection above the character as you move so you're just hit like with this wall of motion and it is one of the most dis discomforting and uncomfortable things to sit through walking around the overworld i did feel nauseous when we were going like run speed in that quote unquote underworld overworld whatever you want to call it and even though it looked nice the sprite work was nice uh, yeah, not not a good decision. That was really nauseating. So we then go into what I'm going to call them the five tutorial towers. And I feel like those, for the most part, were not too bad. I think they gave you, you know, legitimate, actual, decent tutorial kind of levels where you got some time to experiment with the melee. So you did your first couple jabs. Maybe you did rapid stab. Um, it introduced you to uh, walking on a tightrope. I don't think it introduced climbing, that's later in the game, but it, it required you to do some jump attacks on some enemies. So you found enemies, you strike them, you can't do damage, you're like, oh, but I have to be able to kill them. So what do I do? So the game presents kind of like mini puzzles or tutorials for you to figure out. It hits a couple of weak points where... Excuse me. I think the game has some... Uh... What is the word I'm looking for? I would say visual clarity issues where it's not super immediately obvious what is pushable in this game. Like there, there is a graphic difference, but compared to like other games, 
it's way less obvious. So let, let's talk about some of the big statues you came across in the tower as a good example. These towers are about two characters tall, two characters wide. They're big. They're very big. But the thing to let you know that they're pushable is like a little gem at the base. So you may or may not notice it right away. And it's not necessarily a fault of the game, but that's like the start of the lack of clarity where there are several points throughout the game where it's not extremely clear that something's a crawl section, for example, or something is walkable or something is not on the same level as you. It kind of it kind of starts there as soon as the tower where it's like, oh, these are pushable. Oh, and you kind of figure it because normally in kind of games where things are pushable versus destructible, normally the whole object itself is a slightly different color to help with like that visual clarity to the gamer that that's what they want to do. But like once you figure it out, it's not too bad. It's not the end of the world. This is not why I'm calling it the worst game ever. Where we start to see some issues is we are maybe about three towers in. You fight your first big boss, which is the scorpion boss. And that was probably one of the only well done bosses in the game. And I feel like that boss in particular is extraordinarily misleading for the absolute BS that makes up the roster of the other bosses. So what I'm doing as we're talking, I'm going to head and I'm going to open up every single boss. Because we're, we're going to have a long conversation about all the bosses that we fought in this game. But for now, let's stick with the walkthrough of the tower itself. So it's this kind of this concept where you're on this long walkway, this dramatic buildup of lights popping up. So you can see in the darkness, it eventually lights up this big scorpion thing. It has like these multiple phases. You got to hit the claws and you got to hit the head and then it opens up the inner core and then you can actually damage it. And it's actually one of the, as I said before, the probably the only good boss battle in the entire game. And it's so sad. Oh, I would like to apologize. That's apparently in Tower 5. I got ahead of myself. So that's probably the only good boss fight in the game. Where it falls apart is... The absolute terrible, terrible nonsense. Apparently it's in Tower 2. I slightly misremembered where the game has a reoccurring pattern with boss design that is one of the most irritating things I have seen in any game, in almost any genre, for every platform I've ever played on. It features some of the most unfun bosses I have ever played. And let's, let's break down where the game really, really falls apart hard. So, Tower 2. The three cadets, three flying magicians appear out of range of melee on a small platform. And all you need to do is hit the real one. And you're like, oh, but that doesn't sound too bad. Just three hits. All you got to do is hit them three times. They got to come in and hit you at some point, right? Well, how about that visual clarity issue we just described? There is no visual difference that we could find between the fake ones and the real ones. So you have a 33% chance of finding the right one. The other two don't behave any differently. They don't attack differently. They don't look any different than the other one. So you are literally already in the RNG roulette and that is one of the literal first bosses of the game. Not a good sign. On top of that, um, every time you hit them once, doesn't matter what attack, just hit them once. They teleport out of range and they waste your time. This game is full of absolute time waster BS. So they teleport away. It's like six to 10 seconds before you get another choice. And if you guess wrong, you have to sit through at least one set of attacks and it keeps going and it keeps going. So those three hits for us, even though I hit, I think either nine or 10 cadets in our playthrough, it took like two and a half minutes to fight this boss with three hits. Insanity, actual like, actual insanity i just cannot believe it that they would do this kind of game design and let, let let's skip ahead let's just talk about bosses for a little bit next we have uh, one of the big ones is uh known as the what's it called the parasite in the raw tree that thing is only targetable when it leaps out of the hole that it's in and guess what it makes you sit there and wait until it gets it gets into a phase where you can hit it and then you get just a couple of seconds to hit it and you gotta wait another 10 to 15 seconds before you can do anything then they also balance that with something called the Dark Twins, which is a flying boss. We literally killed that boss in five hits. The boss battle was clippable on Twitch. That's how fast it was. 
Then they make you fight the Stormkeeper, as an example, which is a boss where, again, it stays out of range for a very annoyingly long period of time. And then also rudely, when it goes between phase one and phase two, it locks your character in position and it cutscene dialogues you and instantly swings its weapon. So if you don't realize that the cutscene is over, you get hit. So that's great game design there. 10 out of 10. Then they have another atrocious mechanic, the Mud Doll, where literally all you do is you have to wait for an NPC to push a boulder towards you. You throw a boulder and you can only damage the Mud Doll thing or whatever it was called by waiting for an NPC to give you rocks. It takes approximately 10 to 15 seconds and it takes multiple rock throws to kill this enemy. In the meantime, you're just waiting there. There's nothing else you could do. You can't hit it with spells. You can't damage it with anything else boring. Then you have one of the worst bosses I have seen in any video game ever, which is Dark Morph. So its first phase, I kid you not, it makes you wait approximately 45 to 60 seconds, where all it does is a blizzard that pushes you around and tries to hit you into spikes. And that's it. That's phase one. You don't attack. You literally just have to wait there and you just have to hope that it doesn't just waste your time with RNG. And then, like, just, just, to, just to annoy the player even more, its next form, it then transforms, and it does the same dumb thing with the three cadets, except this time, instead of doing the, the there's three of me, it'll randomly teleport. How many teleports it does is random, so another time waster, congratulations. And it'll shoot one orb, and you deflect it like you're fighting, what is it, Agrim or whatever from Legend of Zelda. You hit that one orb, repeat. And it's not just one hit, or two hit, or three hit, or four hit, or five hit, or six hit, or seven hit, or eight hits. I think it was ten hits when we did it. It took forever. That phase was like four and a half minutes. It was crazy how slow it was. And then they have the goal. They have the absolute goal to copy because the boss is somehow still not done, by the way. It goes to phase three and they copy what I consider to be one of the worst boss designs of all time from East One, where it's a monster. You hit it once, it turns into a bunch of bats, it tracks you for up to 20 seconds, it reforms, does a brief attack, repeat. And if you don't hit it by the time it does the attack, you have to wait that whole 20 seconds again. That boss fight, I want to say, was close to 10 minutes long. Maybe it was 11 minutes. That is completely unacceptable for how boring the gameplay is to do this. You get one hit, and it is like a five to six minute wait fest. Then you have, like... I don't know if I consider the other one bosses. The, the, the next boss, I will say straight up I know is a boss, is Bloody Mary. And this kind of goes into a huge issue with the game. This boss is one of the most unfair difficulty spikes I have seen in a long time. Not ever, but one of the most unfair difficulty spikes I've seen in all time. You can literally be in a dungeon, you could two-shot, you could three-shot enemies. And I feel for most people playing action games, they would say, yeah, that sounds about right. You should be killing them in like a very few number of hits once you're properly leveled. But no, guess what? This boss, when you do that with that kind of mentality playing the game, you do you do four damage. The boss is 350 health. And on top of that, it has, again, long periods of invulnerability. It constantly has rotating orbs around you. So heaven forbid, Chad, if you play to this game and you did not learn what attacks have iframes, uh, the boss is basically impossible, to be honest with you. There's what I consider an exploit to try to get around this. But if you don't understand the iframes by this point in the game, the rest of the bosses are going to be absolutely miserable. So, you know, if, if you don't realize that... Okay, let's take one step back. So... There is something called uh, Magirox in this game that you could gather, you could spend money and Magirox in order to get a one-time use of a spell. Terrible system basically unused almost the majority of the game. The only time I found it useful was uh, allegedly you could use it on this boss. We didn't bother with it on this boss. We just decided to level instead. Um, but you can also use it for things like healing or teleporting out of dungeons. And they, it doesn't sound like bad on the surface. The problem with it is just like the absolute unfriendliness of it with the menus and how it interacts with the rest of the gameplay. So like you're either in a position where if you're just 
barely killing every enemy when you go through their screen once, you don't end up with a lot of money in order to then buy magic. And when would you want to use magic? When you have basically low resources and you need to kill enemies that have high physical defense. So for example, you might use them on soul knights or heavily armored characters before you end up getting their weapon weakness in order to make them easier. And it's just like, it's so... It's so counterintuitive because you need money in order to use the magic, but if you have money, it means you leveled, and anything that's a damaging spell is useless because you'll outdamage the spell, and it also doesn't consume resources. So that's that's already like a huge oversight. I don't understand why they did it at all. It it has no 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 synergistic anything with the rest of the combat mechanics of the game and i think when we get to the time of bloody mary we really see the big pitfalls in how damage is dealt in this game so while you might have gone through the tower with some basic jabs and whatever by this point in the game you have learned that most of the attacks that you have are absolutely damn useless they are so useless there is no reason to use most of these moves. And I think this kind of goes into a problem where the game has given you every attack at the beginning. So you're already not really excited to do most dungeons since it's literally just find the stat upgrade, hopefully do some damage. But then on top of that, it's like, if you end up under leveled, maybe you'll use the rapid jab to do some damage, but jab, rapid jab, the aerial attack, basically useless because one some enemies just kind of hit you anyway through your attacks two you never really want to be moving forward into an enemy because they potentially do a lot of damage unless you're really over leveled and then three there's a lot of attacks that just kind of outrange you in general and or home in on you so if you're doing things like basic jab rapid dash or rapid jab or like the aerial strike there's not a lot you could really do to get out of the animation if it's already in it, or if you hit it by accident, you'll just take the damage. You'll take the damage and you'll get absolutely wrecked. There is like a guard button, but once you find out that dash attack leaves you invulnerable, there's pretty much only one reason to use it for the rest of the game. Um, yeah, and that that's not good. It The game literally by this point becomes, oh, I'm going to do dash attack, and there is literally no reason for me to use anything else unless, get this, this game has lag and text dialogue that interrupts your attacks. So if you're trying to do dash attack and you do like either up, up A or like right, right A, or then you do the run button alternatively instead of double tapping into an attack, if dialogue is appearing on the screen, like some enemies will say like, oh, they charm you or oh, so-and-so is doing an attack, it will straight up just take the input away from you. So if there's an enemy that is like, oh, the wolf has howled to summon reinforcements, it straight up stops you from attacking. And also, fun fact, when it's doing that, you also can't open any chests. So good luck just trying to grab a chest and run through a field of enemies with dialogue, because not only are they interrupting your dash attack constantly, but you can't get said item in order to do anything in the first place. Like if you were just there to grab an item and leave, good luck. So then you're forced to use very subpar attacks that don't really interrupt enemy movement and do hilariously low damage compared to the dash attack and or are hilariously unsafe like the aerial dive. I think with the aerial dive in particular, if the falling animation of the dive attack had invulnerability, a lot of problems in this game would have been solved. To be honest with you, I would have had a reason to use other attacks, but the fact that like that dive from air to ground is not safe and it's only safe after it starts to slide along the ground means that there's no way in hell I'm using this when I'm surrounded by people. And unless I'm almost guaranteed to two shot an enemy, I'm not going to be using this for most of the game. So basically outside of the tower, I don't think I really used that move in the playthrough after that because it just became like frustrating to uh, do stuff. Um, oh man, then there was like the absolute troll boss. Remember remember the big fish and mermaid tower chat? Wasn't that really fun of a mechanic where you have two immortal fish slowly moving towards you and they zip towards you if they get in alignment with you and you have one chance to hit the boss that is the real boss and then it goes off screen and you gotta wait another 10 seconds for the boss to come back? I think like the only boss that was okay after this 
Like, we've named almost every boss of the game, which is really sad. And that's why I said I want to talk about spoilers. I want to point out how bad the boss design was in this game by talking about oh, pretty much all of these bosses. Um, I think its name was Hitterduron, the double-headed dragon. That was probably the only other okay boss in the entire game, where you're on a raft, and for the most part, you could quickly kill the starfish. It makes you wait a little bit to do the last one where you have to wait for the starfish to go up then it goes down you get one chance to hit it then it goes up then it goes down then you get one chance to hit it so that, that probably had the minimal amount of time wasters and then we have and then we have the absolute atrocity of this security robot this is this was like one of the most tilting bosses of all time it's attack patterns not difficult if this had been any other game i would have thought this boss battle was cool it's like a a triple stand enemy with like a gatling gun in one arm and a hammer in the other and depending on where you are positionally it changes its attack and like that concept is so cool they could have done so much with it but it's ruined by the fact that it declares and names all of its attacks like it's in a like a an anime it's going to name every single attack judgment has been passed for example and uh the problem with that is that it eats your inputs so, like, I, at one point, I kid you not, I did right, 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 attack, attack, to try to force it to not eat my dash attack. On screen, I moved once in a quadruple press. I moved once in a quadruple press. That is not acceptable with how much lag that this boss had. So on top of it having missiles that lag the screen, it also declares its attacks. It has like stupidly high defense unless you level to a very specific level. So it just becomes a point where you could dodge through every attack if the game did not lag and you could go through it with the dash attack, which is sadly the solution to like every boss is dash attack OP, dash attack as much as you can as long as text doesn't appear. And I think it's just like one of those things where it was just completely ruined by that absolute nonsense so like maybe in those scenarios we could have done the slide attack to try to get iframes because clearly dash attack was just being eaten but like that's not an intended mechanic of the boss it's one of those things where it, it just doesn't work because the game is not meant to handle dialogue or massive amounts of sprites on screen at once and that makes for a really crappy boss design like, I don't care about things having potential weakness differences, but honestly, think about it this way, chat. Outside of, like, one or two enemies, not a single enemy needed an aerial strike with, like, just a normal jump slash in order to damage them. So, like, there are moves that are just literally useless on the boss fights. I, I can't think of a boss we beat with just jump attacks or needed to jump attack. Chat can correct me if I'm wrong. I really don't recall a single boss. But, uh, yeah. And then we come to the final boss, which was one of the most stat-checky bosses of all time. Um, it had Gaia's Rage, which is, like, a very fast laser, which, again, if, if the game didn't use text dialogue to announce the move, would be very easy to dodge. But again, it's gonna, it's gonna speak, it's gonna eat your attacks to do your dodge attack, annoying. It can throw magic rocks, which explode after a little bit, and it's, you know, not that bad. Sonic Boom is pretty, pretty nice. It just, you can either walk to the far sides or just dash attack through. And then you have one of the, one of the worst mechanics I've seen in a while. It, it, they weren't done with copying Legend of Zelda on this one chat. They've already copied East One with the horrible bat boss design. So they decided, you know what? We're gonna make you stand so you have to be on literally the far left or the far right of a platform and you have one chance so it could do any one of these four attacks randomly and it could go many attacks without doing what i'll call i think it's called light orb and you have to hit it diagonally and then after i don't know it going up and down across the screen anywhere between three and eleven times it will sometimes be within range of you to hit most of the time when we played it did not and that's your only chance to do damage to this enemy you could do 19 or 21 i think we saw by leveling by smacking it back into the boss or if the orb cooperates we do 200 damage like do you hear these damage numbers like these are not normal damage ranges 
And we'll, we're going to talk about that in just another moment. But then we're going to go to the final boss. What an absolute waste of time. What an absolute waste of time. It literally starts off the combat with what I'll call the lag beam, where... Oh, Pray, pray you've been holding the guard button prior to any animation appearing on screen because you are not getting a single input for at least three seconds to the point you're basically stun locked and there's nothing you could do. And then also it arbitrarily goes into range whether or not you could beat the boss. So those are all the bosses in the game. So let's talk about why those bosses are even worse than what I just ranted about. So a big issue with this game is how strength interacts with your character and how important level ups are in this game it's not a bad thing to have incremental damage as we level again we've played games like east where leveling levels really matter the problem with it is that levels are so unbalanced that it, it is either enemies are nearly unkillable to enemies are average to enemies die in one hit and that's in the span of three levels or potentially 20 minutes that's, that's not a lot of time for how big that difficulty jumps. So I, I think in the end of our playthrough in particular, we got to see how obscene the damage difference was. I attacked a single robot enemy. I did 21 damage. I leveled once. I did 42 damage. I leveled again. I did 90 something damage. I leveled again. I did 180 damage. So in the span of basically three levels, I had more than a quadruple damage output. Like, that damage range is too big. Like, when it says you get three strength and you're adding, like, 40 to 80 damage a hit, that's insane. We went back towards the end of the game to the same place. I attacked one enemy for over a thousand damage. And this was from an endgame area. So in the same area where I first came in doing about 20 to 40 damage, I did a thousand by the end of the game. So, unfortunately, this game also has a weapon weakness system. So not only is not only is it like super whack at how much damage you get per level up, but then if you don't have like the weapon weakness of something, you also hilariously don't do a lot of damage. So for example, I think we fought like a lot of annoying soul knights in the uh, castle stage with Bloody Mary. I think it's what a great example. Uh, we had a couple of annoying fish enemies throughout where until we got a very specific weapon, we weren't doing a lot of damage. And then like it basically trivializes the whole game. So you as a player have basically three choices. One, do you bother grinding and getting three plus levels every dungeon and make the game an absolute joke? Because that's what it'll be if you do that. Do you go for two levels, but potentially hit some roadblocks as you go through um, in terms of making sure you don't accidentally over XP by beating a boss or making sure that, you know, if some of these enemies are extremely annoying to defeat, you might have to wait until later in the dungeon in order to level. Because again, you might not have the a proper weapon. I think a great example of that too was like, we didn't have enough money since we were just killing enemies every time we went through a screen. And for the most part, we didn't backtrack too much. So we, we killed as we went, but by not taking the silver pike, we had a damage difference of, I think, doing four or seven damage to the wolves compared to 90. And this is on a character of the same level. The difference is like literally 20 times more damage. Chat's wondering if you could one-shot the final boss at max level. Oh, uh, guaranteed. Guaranteed. If you if you hit max level and then crit, guaranteed. I guarantee you can, you can defeat the boss in one shot. So it's just kind of like this weird thing where like the beginning of the game, I would say pretty much up until maybe the mountains, we got away with uh, only fighting through enemies as we came across them. Then it clearly wanted you to get at least two levels of dungeon was about the right pacing. Um, but yeah, like, but there's, but there's no reward. And I think that's just another big thing with it. Like, I'm never excited to kill a boss in this game. It's just like, oh, I fought the parasite in the tree. Wow, that was a big time waste. It didn't give me any interesting weapons items. It gave me a little bit of XP, but that's it. Like, I I'm not learning new moves as I go through. I don't unlock new spell spells or other abilities. Everything you use from the beginning of the game to the end of the game is already unlocked. Like, at most, you'll find some tools to explore the dungeon, which is, like, one of the only highlights of exploring in this game. Uh, being able to, like, rock climb, for example, or dive underwater. 
to open up new passageways is like literally the only highlight I could think of while going through the dungeons. Otherwise, it's like you just kind of view the enemies of, oh, I need to kill a lot of enemies, but this enemy is really annoying because it'll close its eye and become untargetable. So there's no reason to farm these enemies. They don't drop consumables. They don't drop upgrades. They don't drop anything of interest. It's just money. So if you're going to grind anyway, why not just wait until you find an enemy that's easy to kill that gives good XP? And that's what the game just kind of boils down to. It's just kind of a chore. Just kind of a, it's kind of busy work. And it's very disappointing coming from like the Soul Blazer and uh, Illusion of Gaia, where they had very strict leveling, where like monster layers forced a level on you, or clearing all enemies in Illusion of Gaia gave you stat boosts. You could skip them, but the game also guarantees you get certain stats by beating the bosses. So fighting most things are almost completely optional in Illusion of Gaia unless it opened a path. But in this game, there's no there's no benefit to it. Very rarely you'll come across a couple times where spirits appear and they give you like three lines of dialogue for plot. That, that's about it. Now, most of the time you're just grinding for XP and it's very boring. Um, so aside from the literally one button combat that only one move is really viable and the boss is not dropping any tangible rewards. On top of that, enemies not dropping tangible of any interesting rewards. I feel like in general, while exploration does yield a lot of chests, and it is generally worth doing. I can't say the same about any of the other mechanics within the game. So like the big appeal of this game, and I would say the big series in general of Soul Blaze or Illusion of Gaia, is that things you do in the game impact the world. So it's not just like you did a quest, congratulations, move on. So for example, um, Soul Blazer, you gradually revive people and you add new NPCs to the town, you rebuild buildings. Uh, Illusion of Gaia, you... Well, by the end of the game, you definitely warp the world, but you kind of go through and you get to see the kind of uh, progression of relationships with different characters. So it moves a little bit away from some of the world building and focuses more on um, character development with like a main group of people. This game foregoes doing either. You kind of level up the planet. You revive the planet slowly. You get this very... A uh, fancy cutscene of like a minute of like plant life returning and then like continents returning and whatever. But then like, what does it do with it ultimately? You you barely interact with a lot of the stuff outside of uh, the early cha- Oh, I forgot to mention the chapters. So chapter one is all about the underground. Chapter two is once you've revived the continents, you go back, you get plant life and you revive the animals. And that was probably the most cohesive. The first two chapters are probably the most cohesive where things you're reviving you then directly interact with and are required in order for you to continue doing your goals and stuff like that. Um, however, it's just kind of like a long silent journey. Technically, you have a partner with you called Yomi throughout the game, but that character might as well as not be there. They they show up like maybe once a dungeon for, I don't know, four, four boxes of dialogue at most, and then you don't hear from them for like another hour, hour and a half. They might as well as not be there, to be honest with you. So where things start to go awry, and even from the sense of like what you're looking to do, is probably towards uh, probably towards the tail end of chapter two. I feel like a big issue with it is that your character doesn't have a motive. And they they literally repeat this. This is not just me making an assumption like, oh, you weren't reading the game dialogue. Like he said, what am I fighting for? Like at least three or four different times throughout the game. Why am I doing this? And then like you you then as the player go, yeah, why are you still doing any of this? Like after you brought humans back, why are you even bothering to do anything as an example? Oh my gosh. And in order to get to that point before we get to the, the big, big rant point of chapter three and why it is one of my least favorite things of all time. Um, it also just has like really bad level design. So the towers themselves we mentioned before were fine. They taught you the basic mechanics. They weren't like overly complicated. Some of them had like multi-levels. So you had to drop down. You had to think a little bit when you played. Not like a whole lot, but enough. It's like somewhat interesting. Take all that level design, crumple in a ball, throw it in the trash, set the trash can on fire, then run it over with the car because it's gone. It's gone as soon as pretty much you go to the surface. The level design just gets increasingly worse and tedious. I mean, 
I would say from what I can gather online, a lot of people don't like one of the most immediate boss dungeons after you go to the surface with the Great Tree of Ra, where it makes you go up and down the floors multiple times. It is literally straight up a backtrack. I'm not talking about shortcuts. You have to go potentially like 10 or 12 rooms to go, oh, there's a staircase on floor two, but I'm now in, but I'm now four floors down. I better climb up all these stairs just to go up here. Oh, now we're going all the way back down. Oh, now I gotta go back up. Oh, now I gotta go back down. And it's just like so, so tedious. It's so tedious, chat. It really is. And then like, oh, speaking of visual clarity, remember chat where I didn't realize what the treasure chests look like? Like, normally in the game, they're, they're kind of like a red chest with a gold outline. It's very obvious. You can't open them from the sides, but that's not a deal breaker. Some games don't allow you to open them from other angles. However, in the Great Tree of Ra, they decided to make the treasure chests look like the small little pods that you could just throw to move out of your way. Why? I didn't even realize what those were at first. I thought they were just a variant of the rock. Like they were ones that were immovable. If I saw two color rocks and one of them is lift upable, I would assume as a gamer, the other one is not one that you can lift or maybe you need something more powerful to lift it. And given that you don't need to lift it in order to progress, they're kind of like buried behind other things. They didn't seem worth exploring until it was like oh wait that's what the chest is oh damn we gotta go back thanks game that that's real nice of you oh my gosh visual clarity oh yeah bringing up the bubbles i love that the first time you get the flippers later in the game it teaches you that bubbles equals secret passageway so you you see a lake there's like one set of bubbles and you go there you dive in and you go through great is a teaching lesson. The game doesn't have to teach you how to use it. You just naturally inquire that this is what you should do. Then, literally, one room later, when you're going into another lake, you see two sets of bubbles. And you're like, oh, maybe it just means I have different passages here. So now I know that maybe it's like kind of pick a path. And then it's like, psych, get hit by the get hit by the water worm, idiot, and take like 150 damage and die. <laughs> it's like but it's the same animation. Why would they use the same animation for it? Do a different graphic. Put a shadow underneath the bubbles to indicate something's a little off with this one. Like, you, you gotta be kidding me with some of this BS. But anyway, so we're going through, like, the Great Tree of Raw. We could, we could talk to plants and animals. We go through one of the most horrific boss fights ever on the mountainside to uh, fight Dark Morph, which I mentioned earlier. That boss fight was unforgivably long i could literally beat like two mega man or maybe three mega man x stages and the time it took me to beat that one boss like that's crazy to me it's just like absolute buffoonery that they made that boss fight go that long and throughout all these dungeon explorations we had uh, clips on our channel for, as proof they're there forever chat they are immortalized of some of the most horrendous enemy placement we have ever seen <laughs> Like, I know games like Castlevania are normally very punishing for the player just holding forward in order to, like, progress through, and it acts more like a puzzle in order to get through. We're not talking about that kind of level of, haha, you didn't know. This game straight up has unavoidable damage. It has enemies that literally are point blank in the spawn point between rooms. So if you go forward, realize you're in a dead end and go backwards, Oh, gotcha! You got hit by the enemy because we took away control and you got to walk into them. Uh, they loved putting enemies on uh, climbable areas. So you take you spend like two to four seconds climbing up this wall and then they just kind of spawn in instantly smack you and you got to go all the way back down. So then you have to potentially wait another five to ten seconds for them to move out of the way. Or sometimes they don't move out of the way because they're melee enemies and you have to just take the damage on the climb downwards, for example. And that happens not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times, not six times, but at least seven times throughout the game. There were areas that clearly were not play tested because, again, unavoidable damage is... If that's intended, that's insane. Like, that's actual insanity for people to defend that kind of nonsense. Actual insanity. So it happens several times throughout. 
And so there's this building frustration of needing to backtrack because we need an item and we have to go back several floors and there's no shortcuts mixed with really horrible enemy placement. And then you get the level designs in chapter two that they just get worse and worse and worse. And it's just like every single time you think they could not possibly top themselves with a combination of bad boss and level, the game like it, it like pulls it. It's like they have this magic checklist and they're like, how can they piss off the player today? What horrible gimmick can we add into a level that no one likes in any video game ever for things that are meant to be action games? It's like it's like mind boggling. We had literal pick a path where we're climbing a mountainside and you're forced to go down a chute and you have like a second to react which path to take. And if not, it dumps you potentially all the way back of the mountain and you got to start over or it'll put you in a side room, but that's not where you have to go. So you got to play pick a path again, or it'll do things like you're at the bottom of a canyon. And in order to progress, you got to wait for this dumbass slow walking lion cub to go from one side of the screen to the other. There's no way to speed it up. It's literally like 40 plus seconds of waiting for this idiot to go from like the top right to make a big U-turn to end up going up the mountainside. And like, it just keeps happening every day damn level it's like how does it keep happening how do they keep making these mistakes and they're like you know what's great in an action game with already like really inconsistent damaging and pacing and everything else that you know people were getting mad at our combat maybe you know be a great break in an action game why don't we have a long stealth section where we have it nearly instant turn npcs that see further than you can see that will put you all the way back at the beginning of the dungeon. Like, this is like, this is like stuff you joke about being in video games where you're like, oh, there's no way they'll do this. Like, there's, there's no way they could possibly top themselves in like this horrible, horrible brewing of terrible levels with like dead ends that don't usually go anywhere or like confusing passageways or like it's not clear when you need to use like the dash into a wall moment to proceed versus oh that's what a crawlable spot looks like so you're just like balancing like trying to get through the level fast but also trying to observe all these like little things where they don't show you the passageway beyond the crawl space so you don't recognize it as a whole it just looks like level design because it's not like ultra obvious that it's like a hole compared to like illusion of gaia where it's like this literal it, it looks like a hole like they just look like holes except for in like the bonus level where it's like very obviously like a character wide or bigger gap and it's like a character like half a character height in terms of a hole and it's like pretty obvious that that's what that is and you don't really have to guess about it and plus you can also see beyond it so you're like oh, okay i can clearly get through this somehow let me figure it out no a lot of the times it's like oh there's like two lines that are going along the floor and one of them is like I don't know, like five, six pixels tall. Oh yeah, you could crawl on that, by the way. Just nonsense. Or I love that. Or I love that when you do find out how to crawl in some of the areas that the crawl spaces literally lead to dead ends. Or how about that BS when we're in the mountains, the optional area where there are two vines where you had to spend, what was it? 20, 25 seconds of just holding the up button. And if you had picked the wrong vine, you would have to t spend that other 20 to 25 seconds going all the way back down. You take two spaces to the right and you got to go all the way back up. Then you get that one item and then you go all the way back down. So to get that one item, you're potentially spending three and a half minutes on just BS. I I'm convinced that some of this is purposeful troll design and or they hate the player because I, I don't understand how someone could pitch this idea someone accepts it someone else makes it and they went oh yeah double thumbs up this is what we should have in our game so like all that is just leading to like this mounting frustration of really poorly paced dungeons sometimes confusing visual clarity for what things should or should not do frustrating enemies that start getting more annoying gimmicks some of the status ailments in this game, I almost glossed over that. Some of them are the worst I've seen in any game ever. The Confuse is one of the most horrific status ailments I have ever seen. The Curse is one of the most horrific, unplayable status ailments I have ever seen. Poison is fairly punishing. It does a lot of damage, scales off your health. Then they have Deadly Poison, which is like, GG if you don't have a serum, you're just ultra dead. There is like no comeback from that. You are just straight up dead. From that standpoint, 
It's like, mix in all those really frustrating mechanics of, oops, you accidentally touched the enemy once, now your controls are random what direction they are every 15 or so seconds, and on top of that, it'll pop up a dialogue box, so it's going to interrupt your attacks randomly while randomly changing your direction, and it lasts for like a minute and a half to two minutes, which is like horrible. So if you're in the middle of a fight with something, you're just going to keep bumping into things and die. You have no idea what up does. It's going to change, and then when it changes, you can't attack or block. It eats both inputs. <laughs> It's like, it's like actual madness. I think Curse was the biggest joke of all time. Chat saw me. I literally got that status ailment. I don't know if it was bugged or broken. It literally never went away. It was on for 10 minutes. And all it does is every three to seven seconds, it interrupts your character with a second and a half long animation where you can't attack, you can't move. I don't think you can item. Maybe you can. I didn't test it as much. And since we had no cure for it, because that didn't exist at the time of where we played and got that status ailment, it was literally better to just die than to bother progressing through the dungeon because it was just so damn unplayable. And it's just like... There's just all these hateful, spiteful things with the level design mixed with really punishing status ailments mixed with like some of the most wonky difficulty I have ever seen due to level ups. Um, and it has like a near useless magic system. Most of the time it doesn't feel super great to explore. I think my favorite thing is when I get damaged by enemies that are spamming text and I open a treasure chest only for it to be like a medium grade heal item. And I'm like, thanks. I wouldn't even have bothered to come into this room if there was, if there was anything else here. I'm like, if I had realized that was the item going into it, I would have just skipped the room. It was not worth it even in the slightest. So... What, like, what do you have to look forward to in this game? You have a plot that is like, initially goes like, okay, you're trying to save the world, so you revive the animals, you have to go save the lion cub or else something won't happen. And it's just like, just chores. It's a lot of chores that they hoist onto you in order to progress. And you're like, okay, I finally resurrected mankind. I'm finally through going through temples and stuff like that. Let's, let's see how the game goes. And we enter chapter three. And they squander what could have been a really great idea of slowly rebuilding each of the major cities um, as you go by, one, making you do very, very annoying and time-wasting fetch quests. Yes, this game has fetch quests. Yes, this game requires you to kill X number of enemies in order to proceed. Yes, this game will make you go from town A to town B to town A to town B to town A. It does everything. It hits everything in the checklist. I swear, Chad. It's like they invented the checklist before it was a checklist. Like, it's crazy how many things people complain about in modern games were in this game. And it's such a shame. And, like, what's your reward for the town expansions? Is it useful weapons? <laughs> no, of course not. Of course it's not useful. Is it powerful armor so you stop taking damage? <laughs> No, of course not. It's just an upgrade to the shops. You could get items that are like barely on par with what you should already have at that time. Uh, most NPCs don't give you any items for completing their fetch quests. They'll be like, here's a hundred gems. And to put this in context, often at this point in the game, we need somewhere between 900 and 1600 gems in order to get something. So it's like, thanks, if I do like 16 more of these, I could get something that's literally useless in one dungeon. Yay! Pointless waste of time. And this is where it's like so disappointing, where we've seen other SNES games, to make this the most fair comparison, we've seen multiple SNES games do this concept of have one game mode of combat, have another game mode, be so much more rewarding compared to this game. Soul Blazer, in order to get to new areas, you needed to talk to people. It also gave you armor, potentially. It gave you weapons. It gave you spells. Illusion of Gaia. It gave you red rings, which did unlock some things there. It unlocks a bonus dungeon. Uh, potentially, you'll get life ups. You'll get stat increases. This game... Here's 100 gems. Go get effed. <laughs> Just, like, honestly. Like, if this game had like either forced you to level up or given you consistent stat increases 
or getting the town to a certain level, then there would be some like cohesion between like, oh, if I want to learn about the subplot of the seamstresses getting their own shop and watching as the aristocracy slowly falls out of fashion and lore, for example, if I want to enjoy those little mini subplots, make it actually reward you in the other damn components of the game. Right, chat? Like, could you imagine, like, oh, here's another good example. Imagine if instead they, if, if they tasked you with just clearing out dungeons or going into a battle arena. Imagine if that was a quest where they just need you to retrieve an item from a dungeon. So if you already have the item, great. You were rewarded for exploring when you went to the dungeon, instant quest clear, and you could get the reward for completing the dungeon. Imagine if they had more quests along that line where they're like, oh, you we know, we need to make sure the boss of said area is killed. So naturally through the story, you will kill the boss and that could have rewarded in an easy quest clear. It would have felt satisfying. You could have had more narrative where they react to things in the world. Like there are just so many easy, simple decisions that are not like beyond the scope of SNES. Like it, it, it could have rewarded you with like two text boxes and a stat increase. Like, oh, you beat uh, the Deathbringer? Great, now that rain is here, you can access a new part of the village and here's another shop or here's some other things you could do. But like after chapter two, there's basically no point to doing a lot of these other things unless you are so invested in the story. And let me be very clear, the game is kind of like I guess if I had to give a metaphor or a simile, it's kind of like a shift, a, a ship that is setting sail. So they have their sails, maybe they get some oars, and gradually as it goes through the chapters, the wind dies. And then like, oh, I gotta paddle it. And then they lose the compass on the ship and they're just directionless because they don't know what to do. They admit it even in game, they don't know what they're doing. So you're just kind of like, okay, um, maybe I'll steer towards something interesting and the game is like, nah, nah, we're, we're going to make it so that you, you can't interact with anything here. You could go here, but there's no, there's no point to it. You don't, you don't get any interesting items. You don't get that much more in terms of lore. It's just kind of there. They're just kind of there. And so like the, the feeling of excitement for exploring the overworld with its many hidden areas is kind of dampered by this fact where it's like, once you get everything in the overworld, it then makes the dungeon exploration kind of pointless. Because if you do find a lot of those secret areas in the overworld, which the overworld, I will say, will give them one point of credit here. I thought the overworld of the light side was fine. Them doing mode 7 to play up the goal traveler, whatever. I'm not going to complain about that. They, they get to show it off. I think they did a mostly fine job. But like... The things you can actually explore there are very limited. So despite it spanning multiple continents, you maybe go to like one town, maybe two towns a continent, and that's it. And a lot of them are one screeners until you upgrade them. So it's just not very exciting to do anything with it. And a lot of them, not a lot of them, some of them are optional. Actually, no, 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 I take that back. I think they make all of them eventually tie into the plot. But uh, yeah, it's just one of those things where it's just not really exciting to go to new areas because it's like, oh boy, I'm going to get to a shop where I have to purchase this or I'm not going to do enough damage. Defense in this game is pointless to buy, I think, for the most part. You should just find armor as you play. Um, it is kind of mandatory to get weapons as you go since the difference in three attack power could be anywhere between you doing three, 10, 20, 40 extra damage to enemies. The damage scaling in this game is absolute whack. And if you miss any weapon upgrades at all, you're just screwed. I don't, I don't think you can make a comeback, honestly, without some serious grinding. And yeah, just like the people you meet, like I think the big problem with it too is that you have somebody in your party who barely talks to you and you you have all these somewhat interesting characters in Krista, like they try to play up a love interest. They try to bring in the elder as like this all important figure. And then you just like don't interact with them for like 10 hours in the game. So like chapter one to chapter two is like maybe four hours and almost the next nine hours is chapter three if not longer we didn't even do everything we could do in chapter three to be honest with you and even then it's like a lot of these characters you just kind of see them you interact with them briefly you may or may not learn a motive from them and then they're gone they're gone for like three hours and they're like oh remember this character that helped you once uh yeah they're probably gonna die or some other nonsense and it's like oh no 
not not the swordswoman who we met once not not her so i don't feel like an attachment to any of these characters because it's like think about it this way unless we did all the side quests all the animals we don't talk to them again after chapter two the game is like oh yeah you went into a coma between chapter two and chapter three oh and we're gonna call it a plot happening uh because you went into a coma you can't talk to animals or plants anymore are we gonna explain why no it's just a fact you just can't talk to them anymore so goodbye half of the characters we just spent time introducing. Oh, did you want to talk to people in the underworld? Oh, well, yeah, you kind of can't go back for pretty much the entire game. So any character you found even remotely interesting, yeah, they're pretty much not going to show up unless they're uh, related specifically to the final boss. So yeah, just don't bother. You don't need to talk to them again or feel like you need a home or anything like that. They're not important. Instead, we're going to introduce such lovable characters like every, every 90s kid insert with the skateboarding American little boy who somehow destroys castle walls like we had more dialogue with that character than i think almost every character in the game i feel like that's not an exaggeration i'm gonna be real with you chat i think that is not an exaggeration i think he had more lines of dialogue than the love interests i think he had more lines of dialogue than the elder i think he had more lines of dialogue than the king who gets killed off screen because you know this is a game that likes to do a lot of tell don't show he was probably in the most dungeons outside of Malin. Malin was one of the most insufferable NPCs. I disliked her from start to finish. <laughs> I, I, I really, 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 really hated this character. She basically just pulls illusion pranks, and every time it seems like something interesting is happening, she literally just, it's just to prank bros us, like seven times in the game. And it's like, this dialogue was somewhat interesting. I, I want them to actually interact with these damn characters. Like, you can't make me care about these characters if I have like six boxes of dialogue before their inevitable death or we'll never see each other again lines. Like, I cannot feel attached to a character that quickly. I'm sorry. Maybe some people feel that way. I absolutely did not give a total shit about any of these characters because we barely talked to them. In fact, I think Skateboard Kid had more dialogue than Yomi. <laughs> like I and Yomi was in our party from the beginning of the game to technically technically to the end of the game we'll put in air quotes he was technically there until the end of the game so it's like it's very weird to me like where they choose to focus the dialogue of this game or like the things that they do decide to do on screen or off screen like my favorite one was uh, we're just gonna skip ahead briefly just to give an example for people that don't believe me um, the whole like second to final or maybe third to final, I forget how you count it. But when you're going through the, the wizard lab or whatever the heck they call it, the second of the two towers, because, you know, one tower is not enough, apparently. Um, they do all these things where all these NPCs you barely interacted with at all um, come to help you. And instead of having like this really cool moment where you team up with them on a boss fight, most of the time it's like, yeah, we're going to do something off screen and just trust us. It happened. It was totally cool. Um, we're just gonna keep the cutscene on the absolute idiot of your character staring at a wall But trust us. It was like the coolest thing ever and they totally helped you And then like that's not the only time that happens in the game But that was probably the most egregious example because it just happened back to back to back to back to back And it's just kind of like absolute nonsense Like are they ever really gonna explain how he skateboard exploded through a wall yet a warrior a swordswoman and a magician are not able to go through said wall Nope, they're never going to explain it. It's just a plot point that happens. It just it just happens, chat. There's a lot of plot happenings in this game. Like, oh, remember the king who made you do all these things? And oh, actually, no, no, no. Let's actually back up a step. Let's back up a step. Hold on, hold on. Let's let's get this in proper context for the rant. So the game is already aimless once you revive all the animals. You basically just literally wander to destinations. They arbitrarily mention one NPC that is Malin and is one of my most hated characters. And then after that, you don't really have a goal. The Elder doesn't really talk to you about what to do until a bit later in the game. So you kind of go in the transition where he says like, oh, the age of man has arrived, please help them. And then that's about it. You're basically on your own. And you're just kind of wandering through forests and deserts and really annoying places where you have to move specifically diagonal at a certain point or else you get reverted back to the beginning of a desert. Because again, spiteful, spiteful level design. 
Um, and then you end up going and meeting the king in what is the equivalency of France, I believe. Or could, yeah, I think it's France. So from that standpoint, your character just arbitrarily decides to go meet the princess who we have not been told is important to the plot at all, who we've never met before, who is looking for people to marry, and apparently she's mute. And we just, I, the closest we come to an explanation is when we're actually there and our character says, I just want to see what she looks like. And I think that's it. I think that's our only real plot motivation for starting any of the chain of events that happen from there. But that doesn't happen when you hear of her. It happens when you're already there. So your character doesn't have a reason to just walk into the castle or do anything that's about to happen. So... You go to meet her, and then you realize she looks like the underworld equivalent of the character you like. And all you hear from all these NPCs are how snobby she is. She refuses to eat things. She doesn't speak at all due to some tragic event or something like that. And you don't generally have a positive impression of the character. You're like, okay, maybe maybe you're slightly curious why she went mute. Maybe, maybe you would care from that standpoint. But then, like, your character decides, you know what I'm going to do unprompted? I'm going to go to the north, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into a forest, and I'm going to get a I'm going to get a magic mushroom. Then I'm going to bring it to a town. I'm going to ask them to make it into sleeping powder, and then I'm going to return to the castle and I'm going to drug every single NPC in there. That was like one of the hugest like WTF. What is happening in the plot moments where I'm like, you are doing things to advance the plot with like no motivation, no reasoning. It just, it literally just happens. You were told this about a sleeping potion, but you have no reason to drug the castle aside from the plot needs you to do it to advance things. Like the closest I could kind of guess what they were trying to get you to do is there was someone else that happened to also be in the castle, but at no point does your character or anybody in your party go, gee, we should probably save this Robin Hood equivalency from jail. Because like, he never says it. And if he does, and if he does, the fact that it is missable is insane. Like, we just drugged a whole castle. I kind of need a, I kind of need an explanation from the character why we just did this. I was like, okay. And then he, you know, we get the whole silver bell. We go in the woods. We see, like, the boohoo tragic backstory of, you know, JRPG protagonist number 9842 has their family killed and village burned down. Like, it's just, like, the same story in, like, every damn game. It's just, I'm not excited for it. So you go through that and you then decide that in order to cure her muteness, which I thought was really funny because it was really messed up and I don't know if they thought about how it came across, but this is what happens. You go through the forest, you get proof and reminders that her family was here and killed. So then you decide to go back to the castle and then you decide to allow the illusionist to basically pretend to be her mom and dad and relive the events of them being killed in front of her and the king. That was one of the most messed up moments of the game and they don't talk about it. It is literally not brought up again outside of that scene and I was like, that is a plot happening. We chose to do that. We are messed up individuals. What is wrong with us? <laughs> We weren't just confronting the king, because it looked like both of them were involved in that. And then it decides, you know what? She's going to eventually be cured of her muteness because this occurs, because she's it triggers her memories again. And then she kills the, the king off screen. After all that, after going through the castle, talking to him, going through like the hoops and stuff. Yeah, he just gets killed off screen. So it's like, wow, that would have been an interesting cutscene to see to get more plot motivation. And instead they're like, oh, it could be anybody that killed the king. Oh gee, there's just, there's just, oh well, oh, we just could never figure out who did it. And they do that to you for like an hour and a half and they're like, oh yeah, by the way, the, the princess that escaped the castle did, definitely did it. And you're like, then why even pretend like it was gonna be this big thing? If you're just gonna tell me within like a town. So it's like, I just kind of throw my hands in the air. There's a lot of bosses and things we kind of encounter that just have like, they're, they're, they're kind of like those moments where they occur and we're like, we will never speak of this moment again. <laughs> no character will acknowledge that we just did this. Just move on. 
Like, the closest we had to, like, people mentioning Bloody Mary, I guess, was, like, we, we saved Columbus. Oh, man. Oh, no, that reminds me. They have a very interesting view on world history. And somehow in the same universe, they, they do explain it towards the end of the game, I guess in their fairness. It doesn't make it a good setting. In fact, it's, it's really shitty. But from that standpoint, you are kind of introduced for what feels like an exploration age of things. They name a lot of characters that are famous for exploring Asia. You also have people that are famous for just general, uh, you know, sea navigation with literally Christopher Columbus. And then the game decides that we will also be in the same universe where neon signs exist and robots and airstrips for planes that haven't been quite invented yet. And it's kind of like this absolute hodgepodge of nonsense. And it was very, very disorienting. It took me out of the world almost instantly. I'm like, I'm supposed to believe that when Thomas Edison is trying to figure out electricity, that I can go by boat to Japan with their advanced technology and printing presses and everything else. Okay. Or, or we go to the equivalency of Russia for the most obvious bad guy of all time. And they go, they have like this cult. That was probably the only interesting thing that was optional was going into that town. That was probably the only interesting optional thing in the town where we got to see the cult. And then it just, it, it throws out words like biotechnology and robots. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, guys, guys, we literally just discovered the airplane. What is going on? You needed to tell me something prior to this point, because this is like severe whiplash of technology. Like these idiots could barely pilot a boat. And you're telling me there's like full on science labs with DNA re-engineering. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what? I'm just like, Pff. and then like, we're going to talk very briefly about the elephant in the room. So there is another somewhat optional area where we don't really do anything to progress their civilization, despite them being a very important part of said country, uh, China. They have a place, it's like Yuhong or something like that, that is uncomfortably racist. I'm, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm not going to mince words. It was racist. It was racist. It was racist. The dialogue was racist. They had uh, broken English. And they even did, what was it? They went, aya or something. It was so racist. It was so unbelievably racist. Like, it just was like, I saw it. I, I thought it was like a typo at first on the first couple of text boxes. And I'm like, it doesn't surprise me because there's like a couple of typos. For the most part, the dialogue is mostly coherent. So I'm like, oh, you know, maybe they missed it in translation. And then I talked to a second character and I went, oh, no. Oh no, they're really doing this for every character in China. And then, like, it doesn't help that when you compare Japan to China, like, that whole China is, like, inferior, Japan superior. Japan is also the most civilized country, of course. So, from that standpoint, you know, you look at these, like, neon signs and how peaceful everything is on the streets in Japan and how clean everything is, to you go to this grungy, dirty, literally fly-infested China with broken English and like really you know corrupt people within it and it just it just sets such a bad taste in my mouth i had to while doing the playthrough reword basically every dialogue box once i realized that's what they were doing it was very disappointing i, I mean like you, you you can't make it up like if you if you want to go see it the in room for example instead of being like a luxury hotel like it is in several places is like this dark room where you see like pipes overhead and flies are in the corner like this is just so insulting in general it's just like they they did this on purpose this is not just like it's not like a slum anywhere like if the u.s had like a rich place and a poor place you know may, maybe you, you could get away with some of that where you're like oh you know these are the slums slums exist in every place but like no no this is the only representation of this place and these are what all the characters are like and it is just, it's disgusting. It's disgusting chat. I don't know what it's like in other translations. I don't know if it's like that in Japanese, but it was in super, super bad taste. So already I'm like, I am not looking forward to the towns. There's no point to upgrading them because unless I really care about some of these side NPCs that were introduced in the town, um, I'm not really gonna get anything out of it because the shop upgrades suck. They just straight up suck. 
Um, I, I guess the closest you could say is it's slightly more convenient to get healing items. That was about the best benefit I can really say. Is I, I could buy small, medium, and large herbs in more places. That's about it. That's about as positive as I'm going to get there. But it's like, yeah, it, it just inherently is bad. It just, even even if some of the dialogue isn't there, there's something that's clearly not right, even between the, the multiple towns. And it just, uh, it just, it was so disappointing to take something where they could have, they could have set it all in one age, and I think that would have been okay. If, if the other person had been kind of a standalone, that he had been frozen from the time prior, I think that would have been somewhat okay. I don't get how they can really justify the, the world of the robots and everything else. And then people not think they're like ultra evil. It's just weird that you go through like 12 hours of the game and then like an hour before the character shows up, you finally hear a character mention Baruga, like I'm working for Baruga, blah, blah, blah. And that's like the only time the character is brought up unless you go to the optional town. So like if they're trying to set up like this big important villain, don't you think you should probably name drop him more often? Couldn't you have tied some of the bosses that speak to him a bit more clearly to set up like this big overarching evil? Oh, and don't expect a satisfying uh, uh, conclusion to Baruka either. With that dumbass, he, they, they literally did the Incredibles like no capes where he was like, aha, with my technology, I am superior to you and you cannot foresee with your tiny minds uh, the scope of my imagination and creativity to invent these wonderful inventions. Ah, uh, I flew into a fan and died. It's not even a boss fight. It's not even a boss fight, Chad. Yeah, it literally is, I'm a genius, oh no. Yeah, that's, that's pretty accurate. It's very dumb. Like, if I was supposed to feel moved or shocked by it, it just kind of like, yeah, Baruga L indeed. I'm just like, this is how you're going to kill one of your more important villains in the story. It had a pretty weak plot twist. Some people were typing to me excitedly when I started the playthrough. They was like, wow, I really like the twist mid, like towards the end of the game. The twist of, oh no, the evil scientist talking about only the necessary people will survive and the unnecessary will perish through the words of the cultists. Who would have thought he was evil? And the fact that the elder told you to go revive him means the elder is also evil. Who would have seen that coming? It's not a twist, chat. It's not a twist. <laughs> it's a plot happening. Like, we hear these things and we still decide to do it. Not that we're forced to, we're not held hostage. We're not being threatened. We just do it. We're like, yeah, let's just go in the bottom of this murder basement of, uh, you know, we're, we're hearing all these things about how a virus wiped out half the planet or more. And, you know, only if you had a vaccine, you survived into the new age. It's like, yeah, let's just revive this person. That sounds like a good idea. Idiot. Character's an idiot, chat. Also, our character speaks in the third person a lot. I don't really know what that is. I'm assuming they're trying to translate something from Japanese. Like, maybe there's different ways they could do pronouns and stuff like that. And maybe they tried to get the equivalency in English. But it's very weird to hear things like, Arkra is, is the man of this situation, but it's Arkra saying those words. It, it's, it came across as very odd. Um, I don't know, Chad. Is there anything I didn't cover? I feel like I dumped on the game pretty hard because honestly, it really deserves it. It, it was not very cohesive in terms of plot. Again, th there's entire stretches after France where you basically just kind of witness things and things happen, but you have no personal motivation. You're at most given, I think, one additional insight, the entirety of chapter three to specifically revive the big evil person. Oh yeah, enemies without sound effects, thank you. So yeah, I definitely feel like the game is unfinished. So aside from like the poor enemy placement of literally undodgeable damage, uh, pretty much none of the enemies in the final two, three dungeons had sound effects. Oops. Oops, they're all just missing sound effects. So when they're shooting Gatling guns or grenade launchers, because, you know, that makes sense when we're talking about Christopher Columbus. I always think grenade launcher. Um, the sentry guns on the airship, the airship itself, dead quiet. It's basically music and your attack sounds. It feels so unfinished and unpolished. If you had told me this was a ROM hack, I would have believed you. Like, the game doesn't feel complete. 
Even the final boss didn't have like a ton of sound effects either. I think they had some, but they didn't have a lot. So it's just definitely like just stuff was just not correct. And they weren't just like one or two small issues like a cutscene did not play properly. Uh, like with its sounds, it was like entire dungeons. Like, how do you miss that? It's entire dungeons. That's crazy. So I'm not convinced that they did proper playtesting with this game. Either they had no playtesters or the playtesters were given such limited access and time that they couldn't find everything or they were given it and the developers decided not to fix it. You get to imagine your story. Honestly, ultimately, I blame Quintet because this game could have been something really amazing. It had like all the right ideas. And that's why I think it's like a passion project where it's so large in scope, you know, reviving the continents, bringing life back to the planets, building up towns, like all that is like so great in concept and they flub every damn step in execution. The combat is bad. The dungeons are bad. The bosses are bad. The exploration is mediocre at best. Uh, the town upgrades, mostly pointless. Um, the plot, incoherent. I think chat was having an absolute field day in chapter three in particular. I, I think there was no less than three people saying in chat at the time of what is going on? What am I watching? And I'm like, listen, chat, it's a plot happening. We're just going to accept that we can magically merge between light side and dark side and that we're also a baby and that also the character we barely spoke to is now taking care of us because they wanted to and that apparently also the other world equivalency of her is also able to find us and also apparently yomi is just guaranteed to be evil and he can apparently cause earthquakes even though it's never demonstrated to this point and also um he'll age up because every life form on earth can psychically talk to us like there were just so many like there's just it just happens like if it sounds like i'm giving it out of context i promise you there is no context it is like you hear about another hero from the other world, and that's the closest you get to context. And you hear a little bit about Rebirth from a couple of other people, like, in the next life, I'll come back as a mermaid because I died at sea. You know, tell my lover to find me, blah, blah, blah. Like, there's, just, there's, some, there's a theme of reincarnation in the game, but then it's like, the whole, like, end of chapter three into chapter four cutscene, like, what a train wreck of plot happenings. Like, there's just no lead into it. There's no dramatic buildup. It just kind of plays itself out. I love the fact that you you can say at the end of the, towards the end of the game, which version of L, the the female love interest you like, the one that dies for you, or the one that basically avoided you for half of the game. I love that that's a dialogue choice. <laughs> like the game itself felt unsure what it wanted with them, and it gave the player a choice there. Like that came off to me as very unintentionally funny. Where I'm like, the love story is so bad on both of these characters. Like, it's one of those things where, like, you read the dialogue was, I'm sorry I tried to kill you when you were a baby. Like, these are just, like, absolute madman lines that they wrote this. And they're like, yep, put that in the game. Put it in the game. <laughs> S sign and send it. <laughs> this is what we want to do with the plot. It's just like, uh, it's just so, it's so all over the place, chat. And then like, I have a really good question. Did, did I miss something, chat, in the plot itself? Aside from literally all these plot happenings of us going into France, drugging an entire castle for presumably rescuing another character we never talk about and barely even talk to when we're there. Um, did chat understand what happened to Light Gaia? Why did Light Gaia just show up at the end of the game, by the way? D did I miss something? Like they told us about Dark Gaia and that's fine. They had a big buildup for that, and that's whatever. But like, I was like, oh, thank you for saving the planet. Gee, it would have been nice if I did anything the whole the whole stupid game. <laughs> like, come on. Like, w were they sealed away? Was there was there a cutscene they didn't add where Dark Gaia, you know, banishes Light Gaia so they can get the power? Was like Light Gaia really sick because the underworld existed? Why did they only introduce the concept that Krista itself was? raised by dark Gaia and had to go away even though they talked about the entire game of light and balance of light and dark being balanced but doesn't that make it unbalanced that the dark underworld has zero towns now it's just like there's all these things that like when you you try to put it in the in the scope of the rest of the game it's like gee i really wish they would have spent more time instead of talking about sardines about any of the damn plot in this game that would have been nice would have been nice chat you know to not 
not go to the gourmand who has poor taste and probably poisoned everybody in his nearby vicinity by recommending terrible food. Like, it would have been nice instead of those characters, we had some plot. Like, I'm just saying, chat, like, this was your opportunity to kind of have, like, a quasi-party system. Like, for example, like, how much stronger would the game have been if they had just copied things from, like, Illusion of Gaia? And I'm not saying Illusion of Gaia is, like, the pinnacle of game design, but, like, imagine if we had, instead of just going from one town to another town and immediately losing the characters that they continually went to different locations and they help set up things for you like oh i did some investigation and you know these are some areas i think are of interest can you help check them out or you know i i'm gonna i'm gonna try to uh get passage on the ship but in order to do that i need you to do a favor for me like there, there wasn't like a lot of interaction we had with a lot of these characters. And it's like, if you want me to care about these characters, I kind of need to see them in more than two scenes. Like we had almost more dialogue interaction with like the Lion King, pun partially intended, than we did like some of the more important characters. Like Roy only really talked to us at the end of the game. He had a couple of cutscenes we as the player witnessed, where he's like, the equivalency of the, you, you killed my father, prepare to die. He had kind of one of those speeches against the villain who was barely introduced at all and that we had no real connection to because again, they just introduced him in chapter three and only one person really seemed to know him by name prior to that point. And then that character said character dies. Like that was probably one of the longer cutscenes, and it was like, cool, I don't know why I should care about either of these two characters. You didn't give me a reason to. The most I knew about this character prior to that cutscene was he wanted to go see the princess. He got rejected. He slightly helped us at the wolves. And then we don't see him again for a long time. And that's the problem. Like when you when you go too wide with the cast, you don't you don't set them up to be interesting side characters like most of the time when you play the games or at least at least when i view shows and stuff like that like the main character can just be tolerable i don't have to be in love with the main character a lot of the time it ends up being a stand-in for said for like the player themselves so like they don't usually have a lot of strong personalities so to like to really carry the game you need a compelling motivation and reason with interesting characters to interact with whether it's the villain usually it's the villains but also the side characters so you need something to be like okay if i'm not alone i need to feel like i'm not like literally the only competent person in the universe so they don't have to be like combatants they could just be funny they could be like the comic relief they could be helpful they could be like getting you passageways to other places uh, they could be guides telling you, like, you know, you need you to do this, or, you know, these are the legends of lore, I think you're related to them, these are things I want you to check out. Like, there's so many ways they could have had these characters interact with us, and it's like, oh boy, we got to see the love story between two characters who shared... nine boxes of dialogue total? Across, a, like, a 16-hour stretch? I'm, j I'm just not feeling it, chat. I'm just, I'm really not feeling it. And like we've, I know SNES has more basic dialogue in general, but like this game did have a decent amount of writing. And I know Illusion of Gaia had a ton, a ton of dialogue, but I feel like a lot of this didn't really get me into the universe itself. It, it literally didn't know what the protagonist was fighting for. Even at the end of the game, it's like, did I do this to resurrect the world? And I'm like, I think you should have figured that out before you killed the devil. I'm just saying like, you know, maybe, maybe pause and think a moment, protagonist. Like you're killing me here. I need somebody to think and there's nobody for you to talk to. So you have like no interactions with anybody that brings in personality or like caring or any relationship with these people. I'm like, you, you idiot. What were you doing then? What what was the purpose? And I feel like that sums up my my feelings towards Terra Enigma. What was the purpose, chat? What was the purpose of this game other than to frustrate the player? I'll be honest with you. And remember, chat, I said this was going to be a long one. I, I'm not even going to look. I'm going to say it was about an hour and a half. <laughs> Solid rant. We're still not done, though, chat. I'm still not done with this game. I will say from the standpoint, most of the music is nice. I'll reiterate that. I don't know if it's like I'll listen to it as like a standalone thing, but I think they mostly do what they need to do. Um, I would never recommend this for people to play. I feel bad for some of the people that watched. They supported me through the stream. So let's give special shout outs to everybody that's also here. Thank you, Kaiser. Thank you, Imperameter. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. 
Thank you, Dango. I just don't know, Chad. I just don't know. This was a very disappointing game to me. I think I took this game especially personally with how much it failed. When we see all these other examples of SNES games from the same company that, while not perfect, and in some cases, arguably, they have some big flaws, it could have been so much more. It could have been so much more, and it just didn't, it didn't achieve it. And I feel like if they had somebody to tell them to like limit the scope of the game, or if they had been given more time, one of the two things need to happen. Limiting the scope of the game probably made, makes more sense from like a logistic standpoint. They would have had a wonderful, memorable game. Instead, we have BS pick a path, stealth sections, uh, boring snooze and wait bosses. We have level ups that if you level too many times, you can literally basically three shot or four shot a boss. I mean, I think, what was that, Chad? I did one attack that double hit, and I killed the final boss phase one in one attack. Like, that's so anticlimactic to go through all that and to be like, oh, I just needed two levels and the game is over kind of things. I'm just disappointed, Chad. I'm disappointed so much in the potential that this game had, and it chooses to squander it in just the absolute nonsense BS ways. I'm going to need a game to wash this this one out of my mouth to get the taste out. So we're going to be playing what I'm going to call, I guess calling them a quadrilogy might not, or whatever the equivalency is, isn't quite accurate. We're going to be playing the spiritual successor to this game. It's technically by a division within Quintet, and hopefully it won't, it, I, I don't think anything will truly be as bad as this game. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, there are a lot of games that are bad on the SNES. There's bad games across all systems. I think what made this painful is that clearly a lot of time was spent on this game, but in like all the worst possible areas. Like, did we really need a cameo from Quintet as a wink, wink, nudge, nudge? You know, oh, let's talk about Arkra and how he's going to become the hero and stuff like that. Like, did they need to add that over basic plot or playtesting? Like, I would have been fine without them including the whole Neo Tokyo and becoming the Noodle King. Although, to be honest, Noodle King was like the one of the only highlights of the game. If, if they had instead focused on like anything, anything else that needed adjustments, I would have been so much happier with this game. Adjusting iframes, fixing the whack damage scaling, fixing the weird weapon weakness system to not be as polarizing. It would have been nice, for example, here's, here's an easy fix, that if you hit an elemental weakness of an enemy, it just halves their defense rather than doubling your damage. That would have fixed a whole bunch of problems this game had. So the damage scaling would have not potentially gone out as out of control as much. But yeah, they, they really need to rethink the numbers. It, like to me, it's mind boggling that three strength is either three damage, six, nine, 21, 40, 80, something else. It, it just like, it's like the exponential curve to the heavens where the game just becomes absolute brain dead easy and is really unfortunate. Um. Oh yeah, chat, we were ranting. Here's another thing in dungeon design. Where the hell were the save points in dungeons? Why did they take those away? Soul Blazer lets you teleport out and go to like the overworld to get a quick heal from like the main platform you go between the different towns. Um, Illusion of Gaia had different Gaia's portals to swap forms, but also let you save the game and heal. This game is like, yeah, we're going to give you like a 50 screen dungeon. You got to one shot it. And if you die, you go literally all the way back to the beginning and you lose all your items. So it's both like very punishing, but also very easy at the same time. It's like such a weird, a weird paradox because of how poorly balanced it is. Like it, it really is hard to describe in words that you could go from doing literally 1% of an enemy's health uh, per hit to doing 300% in the span of the same dungeon. It's 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 mind boggling. Like it's just like you you would think I was lying or exaggerating, but like it, it happened. It happened more than once. Like it's just it's just it's crazy. Or we do or we, what was it? We were doing uh, one damage to Bloody Mary, for example. We get three levels and we do 21 damage. Like this is the stuff I'm talking about. Like it the game is like borderline unplayable if you don't level. And it's, it's not fun because of that. So I don't know if you necessarily have to go the route of Illusion of Gaia, where you do set damage to bosses to make sure the challenge is equal, so you get to experience the game the way they want it to be experienced. But man, oh man, their level up system is one of the worst ones I have ever seen with how lopsided it is. Like East damage doing two, four extra damage a hit, 
you know, it's sometimes polarizing in like the East series, and then they're like, they're like, st step back, I'll show you what unbalanced looks like. <laughs> like, they win, chat. Congratulate them, they win. So anyway, chat, uh, are there any are there any thoughts you would like to share? I have to think if I forgot to mention anything in that long rant. We had a long rant when we were busy grinding because the final boss was an absolute, absolute joke of stat checking, where literally we went from doing 190 to phase one to doing four on phase two. And that boss had 100 health. So I decided to just get five levels and beat the game. I was like, you know what? I'm not repeating this. I'm not sitting through almost like two and a half solid minutes of unskippable dialogue in order to retry the boss, which by the way, it does commit that cardinal sin of cutscene hell where pray, pray, praise be to you if you survive sitting through those lengthy, unskippable, no text speed increased dialogues in order to get back and retry some of these fights. It, it really does commit every cardinal sin. So, Chad, if you think there are any other... Well, I don't want to call them gaming sins, but if you think there's any other atrocity that I glossed over or did not put in this long rant, please let me know. Let it be known. I want to make sure that this game gets dunked on for everything that it did wrong, because honestly, it again, it had a lot of the makings of something interesting, and it just failed. It really just failed. chat saying it's the worst game of 2024 i i think you know what chat i i think i i don't think i can honestly nominate another game i'm like i think i'm gonna be too tilted by terra enigma everything will look like gold i i could literally be playing like an unfinished rom hack and i would be like yeah you yeah, know that was that was playable you feel like there's more but you can't think of anything right now i mean it is true I, and like, again, I emphasize issues with the plot. We did uh, <laughs> challenge accepted pretty much. It's just like just everything about it. It was grindy. You either grind to fight the enemies and make the game boring or the bosses themselves are a grind. We mentioned the magic rock system being mostly useless. It basically functioned towards the end of the game as just a full heal. That's it. Um, oh, I guess I could talk about one additional thing. Menus. Menus in this game were a mess. What an absolute mess. So again, I, I feel if I had to summarize a lot of issues with this game in a very short sentence, which I probably should have started with at the beginning of the rant, was uh, form over function. They want to do the, oh, it's cool, bro, like of story and game design elements, and they just absolutely fail to make it interesting or fun to play with. So like the, even the menus themselves fail, which is like amazing that you could flub a menu this hard. So they kind of have you diving into the box to go into the menu, which is neat. I like the animation when you pause the game that you go into it. I think that part of it's fine. The problem is, is that they have like four different rooms that you go go into and you got to multi tap, hit a go through the door and then go do this and blah, blah, blah. And so it adds like so many unnecessary inputs into the game in order to go from like an armor room to see how much you need to level to heal between like a couple different pauses. You're not going to do like all of that in one go, but you're going to pause at some point and need to switch into items. And I think where it really, really struggled was Despite having an entire screen dedicated to just one, one function, they somehow still limit your inventory. It's like, it's mind boggling. I'm like, how did you mess this up? How did you not fix this from Illusion of Gaia? How did you not fix this? Like, you're, you're gonna tell me you're gonna give me like 20, 24 like weapons throughout the game, but you only have slots for like 12 of them? Are you stupid? You have an entire screen to fill with items, and there's no benefit to even having the weaker items. It's not like you could do anything with them. You're not even allowed to sell them at merchants, which PS, by the way, is also another problem with the shops. You, can, you can't really sell anything to get more money. You just have to straight up grind. Um, but from that standpoint, it's like, but why? Why not just, if, if you're going to give me like an entire screen, that isn't menu based. It's all very visual so you can see what's in your inventory. Why not just give you as many slots as you need for the game? Instead, they got to invent like a stupid system called the whole hole where you just throw items into the void to get rid of them. 
There's a set of armor and weapons that are considered primary and you can't get rid of. So those exist. Uh, you can hold, I think it's L on the SNES controller. For me, it's L1. Uh, in order to see the descriptions of some of the items. But like, even if you do that, the game is also not very forthright with what an item does, which is crazy. It's like, you have an entire screen for the visuals of the armor, and they're very tiny, by the way. They're like, uh, like end of, end of your pinky kind of size. They're not like character size or anything like that. They're like, the, maybe the head of the character is about how big some of these items are. Um, oh, by the way, none of those affect the visuals for those that are curious, at least for in terms of armor. Weapons do visually look different, so we'll give some credit there. But from that standpoint, it's like, I'll give a perfect example. One of the armors we got in the uh, Beluga's... Or it could be Beluga. Honestly, the Elden R's, I'm not really sure. Um, we went into his lab and we got an armor. And nowhere on the armor does it say it increases HP, but it did it. And a couple other armors seemingly had other effects that weren't described. So, like, even from, like, a basic standpoint of you have literally the whole damn screen to tell you this information they still fail to give you proper information on how things work for the weapons they put in parentheses at least the damage type that it does i think most of the weapons were somewhat accurate at least but it is rather annoying i will state i also don't like for example in an equipment menu here here's what another big gripe especially with the equipment menu if i'm looking to add armor weapons etc why are the things to check your stats on a completely different screen like sometimes you can eyeball it it gives you a little up arrow like up 10 means you're getting up 10 attack or defense like that is straightforward that that's a good example of proper ui and design you want it to be intuitive you don't have to like open you don't have to press a million buttons it's there but when it gives you things that are not immediately obvious like swapping defense for strength or this weapon adds defense don't you kind of want to know how much it actually adds? Like, why why weren't my stats somewhere on the screen at all times in each of those rooms? So I could just see physically what it added or give me little icons for the immunities or something like that. Like, there's it, it's just like even even in just like the most basic things as menus, this game has failed. Like, I'll give a counterpoint example. Mystic Quest shows you exactly what you're immune to and puts all your stats on one screen. And people complain about that game being basic, but at least in Mystic Quest, I had very few, very few gripes about knowing what things did comparatively. And that's the problem when you go for form over function, when you have something that functionally is good, but is not very pretty versus something that's very, oh, look, we're in Pandora's box. And then it's just like a struggle to get the information you need. It's not really that fun. And then combine that with like the fact that like the option menu is kind of hidden in there and we kind of played around a little bit with that and you know if we want to see how much we need to the next level or our cash total we either have to literally kill something in order to see our money total because i chad i beat the game i could not tell you how to figure out your money total aside from going to a shop or picking up more money I didn't see it in any of the menus. That should That's like one of those classic things you don't even think about while playing an RPG. It's like, of course there should be a gold and time spent in the game. Why wouldn't it be there? It's in, ev it's in like a, literally every game on the SNES that's an RPG that has a pause menu specifically. It's just, it's just there. It's just, it's intuitive. You're like, oh, you know, I can look at the save time to see how long I've spent in the game because I have multiple save files and I'm going to see how much gold I have. Or I want to see how much I have to the next level. And to the next level, I got to go like, oh, was did I swap into my healing items that scale very poorly, by the way? Like those 20 HP healers are absolute garbage. Like within two dungeons of getting them, they're already completely outclassed and pointless. So we go from that kind of stuff where I'm like, damn, I got to use like four of these herbs. Then I'm going to head up, go through the door, hit down, hit down, hit left, hit A just to see XP. And oh, damn, I got injured again and I got to switch other items. Best way to go right, then I go up, then I go to up, then I hit A, then I hit down, then I hit left, then I hit A. And now I selected my other herb. Like, there's so many inputs to do something that's so basic and it just it really is just tedious and annoying. I thought the tagline for the game was going to be tedium and annoyance, but I feel like a more proper tag would be form over function. I feel like they tried doing things they thought were cool and were like, you know, things that would have been shot down by a big executive or considered too risky to do from like a game development standpoint. 
and they they just botched it they just they sadly botched it i i really have nothing positive to say about the combat or the gameplay or the plot or the characters except for the music and i think that summarizes everything i think i've not forgotten anything we even talked about the stupid fetch quests stupid fetch quests there's a lot of them to chat. It's not just like one or two. There's like potentially three to five per town expansion. And again, the reward is basically nothing unless you super care about that town and universe when you're not really given a reason to care. So. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Oh, no. Chat quoting me on that one. Yeah, that that is that that also applies very much to the game itself. And it's just very, very disappointing. So what we're going to do, chat, we're going to wrap. Oh, look, that we're almost an hour and 40 minutes of solid rant, chat. I cannot think of anything else in terms of what to say about the game. I feel if you see people come into our chat, either they watch it on YouTube or they saw earlier parts of the playthrough and they defend this game. Chat, I gave you permission to spam our chat with the clips of everything that went wrong in this game, because this stuff is like indefensibly terrible. We didn't even clip like half the plot stuff. Just just the gameplay by itself was like what 40 plus clips plus whatever chat help clip. Like it's it's not like a one off moment. Let's be really clear. Show them the highlights of how unfun some of those bosses are. <laughs> like I could probably go back and clip the final. Well, probably not. The final boss is stalling just long enough. Maybe it's not worth it. But honestly, this game is like the perfect example of what not to do in video games, where you you go too big, too large, too fast, you crash and burn. It's just what happened. And you know, like, I think, you know, if, if they get a very competent team or they get a very dedicated testing team added to them, they could produce a potentially really solid game. So I'm curious about one of their last titles, I would say, that's kind of, as I said before, a follow-up to this game. Uh, but expect to see more quintet games in general, because as I said before, some of them are just, they're not bad. They have their flaws, some of them are charming in their own way. This game is not charming, screw this game. <laughs> so with that chat, I feel like that's the only appropriate way to end the review. So let's give a sign off chat, give them a salute. I need to go get food and let's go say goodbye to YouTube. Hopefully after sitting through this, you stretch, take a break. For the people that stuck around from the beginning of the stream, you survived. I need a break from Terranigma. We will not willingly bring up this game again unless Chad is teasing me about it or something. But from my standpoint, never playing this game again, would never recommend it. It's interesting to talk about as a train wreck side of things of how not to do video games, but I don't think it has quite the charming stupidity of uh, Zesteria to become a so bad it's good. It's so bad it's bad, unfortunately. So goodbye, Terra Enigma. No longer haunt us in our dreams and our questionable places of whether or not things were dreams. And with that, thank you for watching YouTube and hope to see you again in the next game.